If you could please state your name and tell me the city where you live. My name is Joseph Hamilton, and currently I live in Fort Wayne, Indiana. And if you don't mind me asking, how old are you? I am 37 years old. What brought you to the expo today? I came in to represent the sport of goalball and the organization Turnstone, which has been in the city of Fort Wayne and in Allen County since 1943. Uh, they, through the support of their organization, October 1st of 2015, I moved to Fort Wayne, Indiana from Sacramento, California to be a part of the first ever resident program for goalball athletes in the United States of America. Now, can you tell me a little bit about what goalball is? Absolutely. Uh, goalball is a three-on-three -three volley style sport for blind and low vision athletes. Uh, because of the varying degrees of visual impairment, all participants are required to wear a blindfold that blocks out any light, so there is no visual advantage. The ball itself is a uh, blue uh, round ball, similar to a basketball, but with no air inside of it, so it doesn't dribble. It has three sleigh bells inside so that it creates an auditory sound. And the court itself is basically the same as a volleyball court, 30 feet wide and 60 feet long. On both ends of the court are nets that stand about four and a half feet tall, similar to a hockey goal. Each team of three is um, using lines on the floor that are string taped down with like a masking or gorilla tape so that it creates a tactile mark on the floor that you can feel with your hands and feet. We then roll and or bounce the ball uh, back and forth between the two teams of three. So you never actually contact your opponent physically, but you are able to roll or throw the ball upwards of 40 miles an hour and try to get it past their defense into the goal. The game is played for two 12-minute halves, and the team who has scored the most goals after the 24 minutes is the winner of the game. Interesting. What got you involved in goalball? I was first introduced to the sport of goalball at a sports education camp for blind children at Western Michigan University in Kalamazoo, Michigan. The primary goal of the education camp was to teach the students, their parents and teachers, that they did not have to miss out on the physical education experience. And goalball just happened to be one of the sports that was demoed at the education camp. I tried it and my teachers, uh, because I grew up near Detroit, Michigan, which is about 150 miles from Kalamazoo, my teachers thought it was a great physical and social experience for all of the blind students in the area where I attended uh, you know, school in Livonia, Michigan. So they began offering a weekly goalball event for all the students to come and to participate. All right, well, um, is there anything that you'd like to, to say you know, on behalf of your own experiences as a person with a disability? Well, for me, growing up in a sports family with two older brothers who played basketball, uh, I can say that the sports experience has given me the confidence, the self-esteem, uh, and the uh, preparation to enter into everyday life as a person with a disability. I feel much more uh, able to problem solve, to enter into teamwork and group dynamic situations, and also to advocate for myself to try and let the community know when it is I need assistance or when I can manage to uh, solve problems on my own. All right, thank you very much. Thank you. If you would please state your name and tell us where you're from. Uh, my name is Daryl Walker, and I currently live in Fort Wayne, Indiana. And if you don't mind, how old are you? I am 34 years old. Can you tell me a little bit about your affiliation with Turnstone? Um, my affiliation with Turnstone was uh, the fact that I'm on Team USA Goalball right now, and we've been invited to uh, out here to be out here full time to train as uh, Paralympic athletes for the sport of goalball. Moved out here on October 1st, and have been out here since uh, training full time for the sport. So, in terms of um, just community inclusion in general. Mm -hmm. um, what are some of the positive aspects of goalball that, you know, represented going the extra mile to include people with disabilities? Um, I mean, for me, goalball has been a sport that's helped me uh, develop a, a little bit more confidence in myself. You know, I'm definitely heightened my uh, self-esteem as far as being uh, positive and even somewhat being a, I guess, maybe even like a role model for like other individuals for the, for the game, especially when we have our 
Wednesday night community goalball, whenever we teach goalball to the community, uh, Wednesday nights from 6 p.m. to 8 p.m. It gives us the opportunity to um, have people come out and try the sport that we all love and to try something out brand new for themselves and see if they might want to actually continue doing it on like a recreational standpoint. So what would you say to people in the community to get them interested in uh, being fans of goalball? Um, I, would I would definitely just say just come on out to either like a Wednesday night practice um, or maybe like Monday through Friday whenever we're practicing in the morning or um, this coming uh, June, um, from June 23rd to the 25th, we're actually going to have uh, um, goalball nationals for both men and women's teams from all over the country. It's the first time it's going to be here in Fort Wayne, Indiana and at Turnstone, so I just invite anybody and everybody to come, you know, check out a sport for, that is designed for blind and visually impaired athletes, but it is also a sport that I would say anybody who is uh, able to actually do it can actually play. Well, thank you very much. Thank you. If you would please state your name. Uh, my name is Abel Del Toro. And uh, what's, where do you currently reside? I, I reside in Fort Wayne, Indiana. And if you don't mind me asking, how old are you? Um, I am 20 years old. Have you had much success at expanding goalball as a sport and, you know, building the player base? Well, actually, this is a very unique opportunity for Team USA and the sport of goalball. This is the first residency program of its kind. And since we've been here, we've seen nothing like it. Um, and the response that we're getting from the community, um, college students who come out and participate, um, it's just all positive. Everything is positive, and we're getting a lot of attraction. And it's Everything's moving smoothly so far. If someone wanted to attend a game, uh, you know, where would they get that information? Uh, well, um, if somebody wanted, they could uh, go on to usaba.org, I believe it is. It's the United States um, Association of Blind Athletes. So if you contact their Facebook page or website, um, Turnstone also has a Facebook page as long as, uh, as well as uh, Team USA Goalball. So you can um, visit those sites and they have all the current events posted and how to become a member of uh, the United States Ant Association of Blind Athletes and you know get involved. If you could say one thing to potential players out there, people in the community that, that want to get involved in this, um, or just people in general that want to go out and support this as you know something that is obviously pro-inclusion for people with disabilities, what would you say to them? Um, I would say that if you have the possibility of, you know, getting into a club or an organization that provides goalball, it's definitely something that you should get into right away. If not goalball, any Paralympic sport, any team sport, or any individual sport, period. Um, ath being athletic, you know, gets you into good shape. It puts you in a good mood for the most part. It um, provides a lot of social opportunities for you, and it is if some if you are a person with a disability, especially if you're a person with a disability who is new to the Paralympic realm, um, I would say that the best thing that you could do is make yourself um, available to try out everything and take into consideration everyone's advice and continue to adapt and change and put yourself in very awkward situations and uncomfortable situations to, you know, expand growth um, and spatial awareness and all kinds of things that will prepare you for being independent and, you know, conquering those challenges that might, you know, present themselves in the future. So. Well, fantastic. Thank you so much. Yeah, thank you. If you wouldn't mind, could you please state your name on, tell us the city that you live in and also, if you don't mind, your age? Yes, my name is David Reynolds. I'm 33 years of age and live in Fort Wayne, Indiana. Okay, and David, and what has brought you here to the expo today? Uh, what has brought me here to the expo today is just to see, you know, other people with disabilities and to see the programs offered in uh, some way they can come see each other and see each other in a positive light. Okay, now, uh, do you feel like the expo has been successful in that regard? Yes, I believe the Expo has been successful in that regard in the way that not only does it bring everyone together and lets people meet each other, maybe establish friendships that they may not have the chance or ran into each other in, under different circumstances, but also to try to help educate people that may not have a disability or are struggling to take care of family members with disabilities to kind of understand a little bit more of the process. 
I think sometimes we kind of turned a blind eye to it, to people with disabilities, and I feel like we should step up more and kind of speak for some people that don't have a voice for themselves. Do you have any examples of um, events or things within the community, uh, you know, businesses or areas of the community that are not as inclusive? Um, yes, I feel, my first thing I feel is jobs. Um, I feel like there's more volunteer programs than there are actually jobs for people with disabilities. And I feel like that may need to change and it's not going to change overnight, but you know, take better steps to help people with disabilities procure jobs, to bring more awareness. Um, you know, there's times where you're in the community and some people kind of just turn their head or walk away and I feel like that is wrong. I feel like education actually makes that better for people. Sure. So obviously you've um, you know, had some experience with this community. What got you involved in advocating on behalf of the disability community? Well, I grew up in a household where my mother had mental disabilities. My sister had mental disabilities and I helped raise two nieces who had cognitive issues and mental disabilities. So I've been around it pretty much my whole life. And it's like second nature to me. I don't think about it. I don't, you know, look to see their diagnosis. I automatically, first thing I do is think to help any way I can make them feel more comfortable or any way I can help them, any way I can speak for them in a way that they can't speak for themselves. And like I said, my biggest issue is I feel like we need more people with that type of mentality to help out. What do you think is the number one barrier uh, in this community and most that's preventing people from experiencing full community inclusion? Communication. Communication. Can you uh, explain a little better? Well, what I mean by communication is you may have a situation where there's someone who doesn't actually understand what's being asked of them or there's certain things that they may not know because they haven't been exposed to it. And by me being exposed to it, I almost feel like it's my duty to help that person understand exactly what's being asked. Where I feel a lot of people would just write it off like, well, he doesn't understand, I'm gonna just leave it alone. Or we fear what we do not understand as a people and as, you know, as human beings. So it's like trying to get us out of that same thinking and to get us moving in the right direction all as one. So rather than maybe malicious intent on behalf of like local businesses to exclude people, it's more a lack of knowledge and information they just don't understand. Right. Okay, well, I thank you very much, and we really appreciate you coming out today. Uh, thank you. If you would be so kind as to please state your name and tell us the city where you live, and if you don't mind as well, your age. Sure, my name's Nick Clee. Uh, we live in Fort Wayne, Indiana. This is my daughter, Charlotte, and she is three years old. But yeah, since she's so young still, we still... Uh, we enjoy uh, all the Fort Wayne parks and just the playgrounds, don't we? Going down the slide. Slide. Yeah. Have you f noticed or faced any issues involving inclusion or access that have made it more difficult to participate in some of those activities? Not really, yes. Not, not necessarily. Uh, she just started school um, in November uh, last year, so we're kind of just, I guess, starting to dive into uh, the school systems and everything that goes with that and so far so good so what have your experiences with the school system been like they've been good um, sadly my wife's not here today it's just us two but uh, we're in Northwest Allen County Schools and everyone there has been phenomenal and uh, she's adapted very well to her schooling what are the biggest struggles that you faced as a, a parent of a person with disability Truthfully, just the unknown. Um, yeah, every day is a new day, and uh, we're trying to figure it out. But luckily, there's some great resources in Fort Wayne that uh, help this pretty little girl every day. Do you think that the local businesses and government in Fort Wayne have done uh, a lot or are doing enough to help integrate people with disabilities into the community? I would say so. Uh, like I said, we're, we're mostly involved with Gigi's Playhouse, but the, the, uh, the support from... Um, the events that we've done from the local large businesses have been, has been amazing. 
yes, she does have a disability, but she's really no different than anybody else. Still a little kid. So I guess the hope for people is get educated about, about certain disabilities and not prejudging a book by its cover. If you would, could you please state your name and tell us the city where you live? For uh, Laura Burnett, Fort Wayne, Indiana. Now, Laura, could you please tell us what brought you here today? Well, one, I'm a parent and I'm working at the About Special Kids table. But I also have a son who has special needs. So it's kind of like two things in one. I get to find out agencies that get to help them out. So, and I get to help people too. So I like that. Would you tell us a little bit about your, your experience uh, working for ASK? Um, well, I'm just a champion, so I volunteer my time. Uh, this is my second event that I've done. Um, it's just kind of a way that I get to reach out to others in my community to help them broaden their uh, resources that are in the area that can help them because I'm a parent so it gets to help me too so and it feels good to help other people in my community so tell me a little could you tell us a little bit about being a parent of a child with a disability well my oldest I have two kids my oldest is uh, Devrin and he's 17 soon to be 18, and he is uh, severely disabled. And my youngest is John, he's 14, and he's your typical ADHD kid. Let's just put it that way. <laughs> <laughs> um, it's challenging, um, definitely has made me a stronger person. I uh, definitely don't back down for anything, and I fight to the end to get what I need to get done for both of my kids. So make sure they get the services they needed. Um, make sure they're getting support that they need, whether it be in the school, home, community. Um, my oldest, it's, it's a little harder. He is nonverbal. So his main thing, honestly, is he totes along with us when we go to his uh, brother's outings, rather it be uh, scouting um, camp outs or watching his brother uh, play sports. He honestly loves to be right there beside me and just watching them, that is the biggest thrill for him, is just to be out in the community. So he enjoys, you know, just being one of the kids, hanging out and, uh, you know, socializing. So it's a lot of fun. Are there any of those activities that you felt um, that your family wasn't able to participate in because of lack of accessibility? Not so much of the accessibility. Um, I mean, he, is, he, he can walk. Um, he has got mild cerebral palsy, so stairs are a little challenging, his pace is a little challenging, but we make do. Um, the only thing that is more challenging is when it gets colder in those colder months, um, he does have a problem staying warm. But we've worked around that, um, we've, made, we've made do. Nothing's ever a challenge for us, we, we make do. So. Do you think that local businesses, government, and the schools have gone the extra mile to, to help with <laughs> those issues that you face, to make it easier, to make sure that there is inclusion for everyone? Mm. Um, I'm going to say no on the schools. Uh, both of my kids uh, no longer do public schooling for various reasons. Um, my oldest has been homeschooled since his freshman year uh, due to um, bullying, um, abuse, and neglect. Um, I don't think the public school in our area where we, where we live um, supports special needs, whatever it is. Um, they really need to have more caring, more support, more understanding. Um, when the parent says, this isn't working, the, the teachers need to come together and be like, okay, what can we do to make it better? And that just hasn't been the, been the fact for us. Um, it's been very challenging in both boys, uh, both of my kids. So we've pulled them and they've actually done phenomenally better in the schools that they're in now, so. What do you think could have been done to make your experience in those public schools uh, easier, safer, more accessible, not just in a physical sense, but in, in every sense, just to guarantee that inclusion? Um, definitely for my oldest, um, he loves to interact. He is a social butterfly, been one since birth. <laughs> um, 
I really think that engaging the other students um, in their classroom or just like his big thing, he loves music. So having them be that, having be the buddy um, that gets to go watch the kids uh, perform in choir or um, go watch the kids as they practice their play, you know, something like that. So they're not always in a classroom tucked away in a corner. Um, they get to be like, hey, you know, I'm here too. Um, I, I like the things that you like. I like to, you know, watch my friends uh, practice on stage or sing a song or, you know, just hang out at lunchtime. You know, be, be a kid, be invited to go to things. What do you think the number one barrier to full inclusion to this community is for not only just your son, but for people with disabilities in general? They need to have more, um, more community-wide um, programs that are out there. Um, rather, it is um, in the ministry aspect of things. Um, rather, it's um, ways that can get involved in the community. Gotta spread the word, because if you don't know where to start and you don't know you know, who, who to reach out to, then you're not going to get involved. So social media obviously is big these days. Um, and I know there's a lot of things that they can get um, over the internet. So a lot of things need to be out there so people know where to look for it. Um, so just widespread communication is big. You said that you didn't want people to have to make some of the same mistakes that you did when you first started. Right. What would you say to people who are just becoming advocates within the disability community, people who are just now facing newly developed disabilities? What would you say to help them avoid some of the roadblocks that you faced? Don't be afraid to ask questions. Don't be afraid to reach out to the community that you live in um, that serves you. Um, don't be afraid to, you know, reach out to your big organizations, reach out to your school, to be the starters. Um, we're here to help. We're here to lend a hand, for you to cry your shoulder on, for you to scream and yell. <laughs> um, that's what your community is there for. They're for to help you, guide you in the direction you need to go, um, give you resources, you know, that have helped them tips of the of the trade that can help you in your uh, in your journey to have a successful child in your community so don't be afraid to think outside the box make sure you surround yourself with a very strong network of friends um, get your family involved make sure they understand what you're going through um, invite them to um, your IEP meetings, invite them to maybe go on a field trip with you, uh, invite them to get involved. Because if they're not involved, you're going to be out there all by yourself and nothing's fun to do this all by yourself. You're already scared enough. I know I was. Um, yeah. Well, thank you so much for your time. No I really problem. appreciate you coming today. <laughs> It's a little personal for me, but we've done very well. Uh, if you could all just please state your names and tell us where you're from. Rebecca, I'm from Fort Wayne. Hi everyone in the world, I'm Sarah Knight and I'm from Fort Wayne, Indiana. Ida Bell Knight from Fort Wayne, Indiana also. The reason we are here today is that I'm in the Justicers, which is a group for people with disabilities got to theater arts and also I'm with a group called Action Club Johnny Appleseed Kiwanis Action Club which is a volunteer based organization for people with disabilities that we go out and do volunteer work in the community and I get heads up from Fifth Freedom on when the expo is going to be before a lot of people even find out because I'm on their email list and I just love the information that they give us. And I let other people know that has kids with disabilities about it also. Have you found there to be any issues in terms of inclusion barriers that have prevented you from doing the activities that you want to do? No, not really, no. 
we um, I know some we can get different places that does have through here we know different places we can go and get uh, transportation if needed so what would you say then you think is your biggest goal now all of you for you know today and the you know the coming future in your advocacy efforts uh, just keep pushing for what we can get the help that we can get for people and everything just keep pushing for it and ch I'm trying to get her more help too because one of these days I'm not going to be around is there anything else that you would want you know, people to know about you about the community about disability in general only that if they see somebody that has a form of disability instead of shying away from them Embrace, uh, them. embrace them, talk to them, learn about their disability. Don't cry. Ask if they can be of some help, because otherwise they're not going to learn about helping disability people until they learn what to do unless they have a disability person in the family. Then it's forced onto them and they have to learn automatic, try to figure out what to do automatically. This way they learn by talking to people, coming to like these expos. To learn what to do with the people and also I want everyone to see the amazing in everybody because even though we all have disabilities I don't know if they're cuz I'm autistic I have Asperger's but I'm also recently diagnosed bipolar like a few years ago wasn't it mom about 18 months about 18 months ago I was diagnosed with bipolar disorder and I also want people to know that there's places out there that can help them, especially those with mental illness. I want everyone to know that there is hope and that everyone is amazing. Also, that we should all be able to include each other in our art, in art in music, especially in the performing arts, because nowadays, back before there were like lots of arts before, Gestures, there is no outlet for people with disabilities without performing arts. And now with gestures and everything else, there is a big awareness of performing arts. So if people can come out, see that, go to like a Special Olympics event, and just talk to people that has some form of disability, it will be a great help, not to just us, to explain our disabilities, but to everybody. Thank you very much for your time. You're welcome. You're welcome. Bye, everybody in the world. If you would, could you please tell us your name and what city you're from? I'm Molly Still, and I live in Fort Wayne, Indiana. Now, what brought you to the expo today? Um, I am on a cheer team called the Dazzlers, and we, um, it's actually a cheer team for like a bunch of people with disabilities, and we just can do normal people stuff and not have to worry about like if we're like being judged or stuff like that so so you're here representing the dazzlers today yep and that's your outfit yep it's a great outfit Thanks. do you enjoy your activities with the dazzlers yes i do it's actually my first year doing it so it was awesome giving the opportunity to be here and perform for a bunch of people. Do you ever find yourself um, unable to do some of the activities that you wish you could do around town? Yeah, but I just kind of have to deal with it and move on. Uh, do you go to school locally? Yes, I do. I go to Northrop. Really? And how do you feel Northrop handles the you know, disability inclusion aspect? I mean, and they could do a better job, but I mean, it's average. But you feel like you do get an opportunity to participate there? Yes. What do you think, what uh, issues do you face in your life that make it difficult to participate in the community? Oh. Um, it just, like, everything in my life is kind of hard for me to do, but I 
just knew I knew it in a different way, but I still get to do everything I want to, but I have to do it in a different way. And yes, I do get dis discouraged and I do sometimes cry like last night. I and just like there's an issue with like people always bullying people and that's not okay with me. It's like I'm for one trying to stand up being in the, all this cheer team and saying I can do stuff, I can do this. So yeah. You obviously spend a lot of time, you know, advocating on your own behalf and making sure that you can participate in the community. What advice would you give to someone else that's in a similar position to you but maybe hasn't taken time or taken the step to participate in stuff like you have? I'm just going to say that life will throw things at you that you might not be expecting it to, but you just kind of got to roll with the punches and in, in, in the end, it'll all work out and you just got to think positive and tell yourself you can do this. Well, that's really good advice. Thank you so much. You're welcome. We really appreciate you coming out today. Thank you. It's my pleasure. Do you have any parting words? Um, I'm just gonna say that I, I love what I do and I'm so thankful for everybody that lets me do what I do and yeah. Thank you. Have a great day. You too. If you would please state your name, the city where you live, and if you don't mind telling us your age. <laughs> William Bailey, Fort Wayne, Indiana, 63 years old. Now, what brings you to the expo today? Uh, we have our own booth, Fort Wayne Amputee Support Group. Could you tell me a little about the support group? The support group is for um, people who have gone through an amputation and have uh, stories to share or questions about upcoming amputations or questions about uh, different devices and prosthetics that uh, they've been equipped with. And we bring in speakers to talk about uh, things that would interest basically anybody, things on taxes, pain management, uh, cooking, you know, anything, uh, self-defense is big, those kinds of topics. Uh, we try to cover as much as we can. Now, how long have you been involved with this support group? Uh, I'm going on three years now. Can you tell us a little about your experience of, of living uh, as an amputee? Yeah, in this, uh, just briefly, just uh, so you know that uh, I had a staph infection and um, it basically ate up my left leg after a knee surgery and I was very, very ill uh, for a period of eight months. Uh, different antibiotics weren't working the staph infection was starting to spread, so I had a choice of uh, losing my leg or trying to save the leg and taking a chance that the staph infection would spread and kill me. Uh, so I went with the amputation, and the odd thing is that I had been so sick that when the amputation occurred, uh, I felt actually very good, and it was a, uh, a dilemma. I wasn't sure whether to mourn the loss of the leg or celebrate the fact that I felt so well. Um, other than that, uh, my life as an amputee, I've tried to make it as what you would consider as normal as possible. I don't use uh, special devices in my house. I don't use a wheelchair. I don't use a walker. I have a cane, and when my, legs are, my leg is off, I use crutches. Um, and I try to live uh, as normally as possible. Aside from obviously participating in the support group, what other kinds of uh, community activities do you participate in? I help uh, 
I drive for the uh, the League of the Blind. I drive them around once a month, the uh, different activities they have, normally with their singing group. I, uh, I'm a member of Turnstone. Uh, I work out three times a week. Um, the prosthetics company that uh, I deal with asked me on occasion to demonstrate uh, different situations for uh, upcoming grads for, that are going to be uh, physical therapists and things. Those are the kinds of things I'm involved with these days. From your own personal experiences in your life, have you faced any issues uh, where you were not able to be included in something you wanted to be? Uh, yeah. Uh, I went on a vacation with my wife uh, out to Colorado, and uh, on the way back there was a, uh, a waterfall uh, that had to do, it was a stream that ran along I-70 or, or something that we were on. And there's a huge sign out there that's saying, you know, X number of people basically die every year, you know, horsing around trying to go to this waterfall. And it says, if you have any physical limitations, you should really not, it's not worth seeing <laughs> for you. <laughs> so I had to pass on that. And I was kind of, a, my wife took pictures, but it's not the same as being there. And it's in that, I, at that moment, I felt handicapped. The same way I feel every night when I take off my leg. Those are the moments I feel like I'm a handicapped person when I'm not able to, to blend, I guess, with the regular people. So with your work with the support group, um, your own personal individual advocacy, what is the number one goal that you're working towards? Um, letting people know uh, with like disabilities or any disability that has to do with amputation that you're not alone that there are people just like you out there, that they understand, that we can help. In many cases, we can help if there's a problem. Because uh, some people come in and it's a, it, the problem it maybe isn't exactly that the amputation has occurred. The problem uh, becomes amplified because it, it affects them as a person. All of a sudden, they don't feel whole. They don't feel like they're a good partner for their spouse. Uh, they might feel that uh, they're no longer productive or that their role uh, within the household's changed. Maybe now it's the spouse that has to go out and earn the money and they're at home on this and they're doing the, the what used to be called the, the homemaker's job. Um, our purpose is to give support mentally, moral, uh, physically if we have to, to people that, that uh, have these kind of issues. And we hope that uh, through the speakers we have and through the, the group itself that in some way, some small way sometimes, that we can help a person like this and help them realize that there is still worth no matter what they've lost physically. What advice would you give to someone in a similar situation to you who's facing a life-altering situation like this for the first time and they feel lost? Okay, um, <laughs> my advice would be that uh, A, that their life's not going to be over, uh, B, that if their purpose or they see their, their future purpose is to uh, feel sorry for themselves, that they need to be slapped in the head and made to realize that, uh, you know, you're not you're not losing anything. And in, in many ways, uh, the loss of a limb, actually, uh, th there's something to be gained. There is uh, a door or a window that opens for you on a world you didn't realize that was out there. And it, it's meaningful, uh, and it has worth. We really appreciate you coming in here today. Do you have any parting words to offer? Just to hang tough. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you so much. You're welcome. If you could please state your name for us. My name is Nathaniel Bautel, and I live in Columbia City, Indiana. Okay, now tell me a little bit about some of those activities that you do. I do photography in Columbia City with Passages, who works with me. And I do uh, pottery at Passages, who works with me. And then I do art like paintings and uh, like drawings and stuff like that, and they w work with me too. Okay, now tell me a little bit about 
uh, some of the, if, if any, if the difficulties that you've run into in terms of inclusion? Um, mine is I can't read that well. I have a third grade level of reading. So my reading is really hard, but like knowing anything or understanding is really easy. But knowing like my reading, like some of questions, you know, like texts on my phone and that. But I am getting to learn how to read a little bit better with a reading agency that works with me. And have you found that to be a good agency? Yes. It's called Labach Reading, who works with me. Um, my mother and my parents work with me, and then I bring my reading books home where I live in Columbia City with two other roommates as well. Okay. Now, uh, do you go out with your roommates at all ever and do activities in, in mm -hmm. Columbia City? We go shopping together. We um, work together. We do like mowing the yard together. I live with two other roommates, so we do a lot together, you know, going out in public to do things. Are there ever any activities that you wish you could participate in, but you haven't been able to? I want to do, it's not here, but Big Buddies and Big Sisters um, company. I, I'm affiliated with the Indiana Arc Association, and they do that in Indy, and I would like it to, you know, get, involved and I would love to do the big buddies and big sisters thing. Do you feel like local businesses and government are doing a good job of including people? Yes. Columbia City does a very good um, understanding of people with uh, intellectual disabilities. They work with us. They understand us. You know, people that work with us do do a good job. Do you have any recommendations or things that you think that they could do better to increase community inclusion? You know, I just spread the word out that everybody in my term, no matter if you have a disability or not, you're a work of art no matter what you do in life. And that is my saying all the time. You know, we all have, you know, flaws, but we all, I don't classify you as any different than anybody else in life. So obviously then you advocate on your own behalf, but also yes. for other people who are in your same situation. Yes, I do. I'm on the self-advocacy board for uh, the Indian Arc down in Indy. I'm on that board and I self-advocate for a lot of people. That's good. Um, what do you think is the biggest barrier to f community inclusion for you and uh, just anyone in general in your community? I think it's a hard thing because they don't, like they don't understand people with some people don't understand people with a disability and i wish they would understand them or get to know them better than just exclude them out of something or some things you like oh well you know you can't do this but you can do this but you're good at this but you're not good at that you know different things you know and I wish they would understand that. You know, my, my thing is, I can't read that well, but train me and I will be good at that maybe to read, you know, better to do the cashier register or something because I don't feel good with money, but you know, things like that. So if someone were in the same position as you and, you know, dealing with these same issues, what would you recommend to them to do? I would recommend like, to go out, try and get help that if you need help, you know, there's always help out there of agencies or companies that would help you understand what you need, you know, a disability or whatever kind of thing you have. There are agencies out there to help you. Well, thank you very much. We really appreciate you coming out today. Thank you. And I really appreciate your time for interviewing me. Oh, we're happy to have you. Thank you. If you could, could you please tell us your name? My name is Jeffrey. Thank you for saying your name. Thank you. Did you get that? Now, do you live here in Fort Wayne, Indiana? I live. I live in Fort Wayne. The Fort Wayne area of my life. I live in the Haven right now. Uh, do you mind me asking, how old are you? I'm 29. And what brings you to the expo today? I, I, I'm part of the SC Club. We are 
a group of disabled adults for the first we do the different service projects, so I was volunteering for them. So, how long have you been volunteering? Um, well, I've been about uh, five years. In the time that you've been doing that work, um, have you run into any barriers or problems that you really felt needed worked on in the community? Um, there, there's always barriers, right? When I go out, sometimes the parking spots are not wide, wide enough for me to get my van list out, right? You just deal with them, so you just learn to adapt to them. Can you tell me a little bit about what you think of the educational opportunities in the state of Indiana for people with disabilities? It's, it's interesting you say that, because my father and I started a new business for people 18 to 22 because we saw, saw a gap in the educational system once they, once they got on us to, to the end pack, there was a gap, so they did left behind. So we're trying to fill, fill the gap. What about your personal experience with education uh, in Indiana? Uh, well, uh, um, if you don't have, I've been very fortunate to have the respond parents, and I have, I have a book. My mom is a teacher. She's been an educator for many years, so she knew the system for the inside, so I was very fortunate in that way, but there has been a significant um, change over the last few years, I would say, in the accessibility of people with disabilities, so, but... If someone were in the same position as you, facing some of the same hurdles, what advice would you give them? I, I would say you got, you got to have a positive attitude, and you got to, you got to remember every day is a good day, and make the best of every day in the year. In the, I. But my dream is to be president of the United States. So there's, there's nothing you can't do if you just try, try hard and have the right support system around you. So don't limit, your, don't limit yourself because... And uh, it breaks every day. So. so is that support system what helped you when you were going through college? Yeah. Yeah, I had it. I had a note taker um, for college for Ivy Tech. That helped me. And their office of the disability services was good for me. Were there any things in the community, activity-wise, education-wise, that you felt like you wished you could have partaken in but weren't able to? Um, no. I had a pretty, pretty full college experience, so I wouldn't say, I wouldn't say, no, no. Um, we really appreciate you coming today, and honestly, having people like you advocating on your own behalf, but for 
people as well in the community yeah. is exactly what we need. Thank you very yeah. much. Thank you. My name is Orlin Holmes. I live in the city of Fort Wayne, Indiana. I'm 65 years old. Fourteen years ago, I, I went from working full-time to being totally disabled 13 days. I was sent home to die. I found out I had severe COPD. I walked around on oxygen for 10 years with about 17% lung capacity. And then four years ago, I received a double lung transplant. My kids will never forget that when I got discharged from the hospital, it was on election day, and the first thing I did was go vote. I could hardly stand, but I went and voted. <laughs> so I am an advocate for the COPD Alpha One uh, community, as well as, as uh, organ donation and transplantation and smoking cessation. That's, uh, it has impacted the way I live and how I choose to spend my time. I spend most of my time either doing some sort of recreation or advocating for some cause. Similar to Fifth Freedom, I advocate for you too. Well, the, the biggest barrier that most people, and myself included, face on, on a certain, on different days is, you know, dealing with people. And uh, some people are very ignorant and stupid about how they deal with others. You've got politicians that are set in their ways and don't want to talk to you, or, or they'll give you lip service, but they won't do anything. And um, that can be very frustrating. So after a while, you know, you, it feels like you're just banging your head against a wall and you're not getting anything done. Hope I didn't do too bad. <laughs> you did fine, thank you. You're welcome. <laughs>